Good evening, everyone. We'll kick off, I think. Um, welcome to uh, the February um, event for the Ener Energy, Environment and Climate Action Division of Engineers Ireland. And welcome to all of those who are uh, connected remotely on the webcast. Uh, I think the details are up there in, on, this, on your screens. It should be for anyone who wants to participate. There's uh, an email, engineersforclimate at gmail.com and a Twitter handle, engineersforclimate hashtag. So, We'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you this evening. Um, the talk this evening is on the Huntstown Anaerobic Digester Facility. It's uh, 4.8 megawatts, the largest of its type in the country, um, processing about 90,000 tonnes of, of waste. And uh, it's, um, it's something that the, the government is very focused on in terms of the, the Climate Action Plan and, and looking at the potential of renewable gas uh, in, in, in helping us reach our targets for 2030. Uh, we're very fortunate this evening to have Dr. Stephen Wise with us. Um, he's the Bioenergy Bio Director at Energia. He's also the Director of the Institute of Biotech Innov Industrial Biotech Innovation um, the Centre. So Stephen has over 20 years experience. He's a, a wealth of experience in, in waste and recycling and renewables. He's worked previously uh, with Suez, Renui, Ricardo and Wood, and he's delivered multiple AD plants. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing from him this evening about his experience um, at Homestead. So welcome to Stephen. Thank you very much for that, that introduction and thank you for, for coming along. First point of the evening, I didn't vote for Boris, I didn't vote for Brexit and I voted to stay in. So I shouldn't take any other questions on, on that but I keep getting asked so that's that one. Um, so as, as the introduction said, I've, I've got a, a sort of a background within the anaerobic digestion, waste and recycling industry and have seen that develop in, in Europe and the UK over the last sort of 20, 25 years. And we're starting to see some of that same development here now in the, the all island market. So hopefully we're able to bring some of that experience we've gained in other places and not go into the, the same pitfalls um, that we have it we've seen in other countries but also now I think we are very much on the the cusp of of the environment in which we're in changing to be more favorable to this type of, of technology things like the the impacts on on climate change how we're seeing some of that impact directly on on health as well a whole wealth of things so we're starting to sort of see a push very much to, towards this so in terms of what we'll run through, very much a general overview of, of bioenergy, look at the UK bioenergy market as it's sort of the, the next door neighbour and as a comparator for, for development, what's going on here in Ireland at the moment, and then a, an overview of the, the Huntertown bioenergy plant, which is very nearby up in the north side of Dublin. So in terms of, of who are Energia Group, I don't intend to go very much into this. If you want to find out about who we are, there'll be the slides available so you can have a look. Safe to say that Energia uh, covers the all island market. We've got a plan over the next five years for €3 billion Euros worth of investment in new generating capacity, which includes new onshore wind, um, offshore wind, more flexible generation, and hopefully more uh, bioenergy plants as well. And the plant at Huntstown is our first of the fleet of, of bioenergy plants. So we know and we've seen on the news, we've seen a, a lot of, of, of impact that the world we're living in is, is starting to change. That climate around us is changing. Now, whatever is the cause of that, I'm not going to go into that. Obviously, there, there's a lot of, of weight in favor that we're actually causing that change. But we are seeing that we're starting to get more erratic weather. We're starting to see that the, the temperature fluctuations going up and down. And we're starting to get these changing patterns. And what we're trying to do in terms of, of how we live is try to reduce that impact on, on the environment and the climate that, that we're within. So things like the, the development of bioenergy plants, making better use of, of the waste resources that are around us is actually helping to promote that. If we take the, the waste sector, which is what we're looking at partly with, with the Huntstown plant, that we've had waste originally would be buried in, in landfill. That would have been landfill that didn't capture gas. That gas would go to atmosphere. We've then seen the capture of, of gas coming out of landfills and put to, to some beneficial use. And then we started to see that the you know, recycling streams come into place, take out those valuable commodities like paper and cardboard, do something with them, leaving less to go into landfill. And we started to see the introduction of energy from waste. So we're actually able to combust that material thermally and generate both electricity and heat. So again, we're seeing greater use of it. And now we're starting to see as the sort of the next phase of that, what else can we do? And actually we've got a very valuable resource in terms of an energy resource with that organic fraction. And we can actually put it through a, a process to generate things. 
So what is bioenergy? Very simply, it's the conversion of biomaterials, so things like food waste, paper, cardboard, wood, and other forms of waste into renewable energy. And by that, I'm not just talking about electricity, but we've got the, the gas itself. We can look at heat. We can look at vehicle fuels. There's a whole multitude of, of different approaches we can take. So looking at that in terms of the, the value chain, if I was to say, um, obviously, if you're all, you know, you've all got a, a three bin system, I'm, I'm assuming at home, if you know where your waste goes from those three bins, stand up. So nobody in the, oh, one, one sort of standing up, so probably, and a couple, so very few of you know where, where that waste goes at the moment. And that's one of the problems that, that, that we face as a sector is people have this presumption that it's just going to that hole in the ground, as I was saying. And actually, it isn't. One of the, the good things, and I'll explain a little bit later on, is we've got a very consistent three-bin scheme here in Ireland, which helps in terms of capturing relevant materials. And if you live within the Dublin area, so if you could stand up if you're in the Dublin area. So a few more of you are local, you will now find that a good proportion of your organic waste from your brown bin or from your black residual bin is now going to end up generating energy at our facility at Huntstown. So you are contributing to generating renewable energy and to reducing the impact on climate change. So what we're showing here is we've got different types of waste. We've got the municipal waste, which could be the, the brown bin, it could be the black bin residual material. And showing a picture of some food waste there coming out of the back of a, a lorry. We've got bio crops that can be grown. That may be forms of, of willow as a wood. It may be forms of, of grass or other things that we've got these crops that harness energy. We can use them in a beneficial way. And we can convert some of those into things like wood chip pellets or other materials that can be put into a, a pellet form and, and converted. We can then put it through a bioenergy plant. Now, traditionally, we would have just talked about anaerobic digestion. We've also seen for, um, if you take some of the big plants in the States where they're taking in and producing ethanol and producing other vehicle fuels, et cetera, and other energy out of the back of that, these are now very much bioenergy refineries. And a lot of work is being done into how we can harness the outputs of these, not just in terms of the energy value, but other important chemicals that are generated during that process, other materials that we can actually extract and use in a beneficial way. So it's becoming more of a refinery rather than just a, an energy generator. And that's all about trying to increase the value that we get from these. And again, as I go through the, the plant for Huntstown, it's not just about one output, output. We get multiple outputs that have got different values, and we're looking to, to actually maximize those values and use them in a beneficial way. So it's thinking much bigger than just energy. We can do various things. But when we focus in on the energy directly, the easy one to look at is electricity. So if we're talking anaerobic digestion plant, you burn that gas, you generate electricity. But at the same time, you're generally wasting a whole heap of, of heat. Probably half your value is being wasted as, as heat. So the other way of doing it is to actually keep it as a gas, refine it, and perhaps put it into the gas network. And that's a much more efficient way. So putting it through a, a, a power plant, you'll get about 40 to 45% efficiency. If we put it into the heat network, you're sort of massively increasing that to perhaps about 85, 90% efficiency in terms of capturing that and using a point of source. So putting it in the in the gas network, using it at home as part of your heating system or in some similar way, so or for cooking, for example. The other way we're starting to look at it now is to actually then take that gas, convert it, and put it into a clean vehicle fuel. And as we go through, there are other benefits to doing that as well in terms of we've seen, you know, over recent um, years, the impact of congestion on cities, Dublin being a prime example, particulates in the atmosphere from petrol and diesel vehicles, the health impacts on that, there's a whole heap of, of studies in terms of, of direct health impacts if you suffer from things like asthma, indirect health impacts on long-term ability to learn um, from being in close proximity to that type of environment. If we're able to help start cleaning up that air by using a much cleaner vehicle fuel for things like cars, for buses, for trucks that are operating within that area, we start to get other social and economic impacts. We're not putting the strain on the health system, for example. So you start to see these much wider benefits from, from actually deploying this. It's not just a single bit of, we're creating some green electricity, aren't we good? There's actually these much, much wider benefits that we really need to take into account when we look at the social benefits and the, the sort of cost benefit analysis of this type of, of system. So in terms of the, the UK bioenergy market, as at the end of, of last year, 
we had just shy of 400, just shy of 500 operational AD plants across the, the UK. And because of the change in the, the tariff mechanisms, we originally had what was re called ROCs, Renewable Obligation Certificates. We then moved to the FITs, the feed-in tariff. They were all about electricity. All of those plants were originally generating electricity, either on small scale or larger scale, putting it into the, into the grid. We then had the introduction of the Renewable Heat Incentive, or RHI, which was really about putting gas into the network. And that's seen a large development of biomethane plants, so in terms of gas injection into the network. And that's really then about capturing more of that energy value, as I was saying earlier. And the latest development of that is the, the RTFO, Renewable Transport Fuel Obligation. So we're now starting to see a number of those bioenergy plants actually, rather than putting it into the grid, convert it to vehicle fuel and sell it back that way. So to have that benefit, I was saying, in terms of, of vehicles and transportation and reducing the emissions at, at that particular point. And one of the things that we've seen in the UK in terms of how this has been adopted is that originally, if you had an AD plant, we take our project, for example, up in, in Northern Ireland, we get a certain number of ROC certificates for that. And every plant that was built, if they were built within that time period, would get a certain number of ROCs. And it didn't matter how many plants were built, there was an, almost an endless pot of money for doing that. What we've seen over time is that rather than taking that approach, We've had a, a digression taken where there is a certain pot of money. Let's to take, for argument's sake, 100 million pounds on round one of a particular tariff. If that is completely uptaken and there's an over oversubscription, so actually there, there's more wanting to buy into that than is available, the next time it comes out, that will then be decreased to, say, 80 million pounds. And if the same is happening again, it'll be further decreased. So it's a way of encouraging a more competitive marketplace. It's pushing down the cost of building and operating the plant, which means that that subsidy pot is decreasing. So you're starting to see competitive benefits. What it's also encouraging is to extract more value. So be less wasteful with the plants and actually extract more value out of what you're producing. It's not a perfect way of doing it, but I think it's actually encouraged some very good behavior within the UK market for innovation in terms of making sure the plants are cost efficient in terms of the building, so the capital cost, and in terms of that operating cost, so the operational cost. So that's had some, some real benefits. And again, this is the type of lesson we should be able to take from other places and bring into the, the discussion here in Ireland over which is the best way of encouraging the right type of behavior from developers and operators to roll out the technology with the most efficient benefits that we want. The other thing that we've, we've seen because of having a fairly stable set of subsidies is that there has been a, an ongoing pipeline of, of new projects. It stalled a little bit when there was an uncertainty over some of the subsidies and we've now got round about another 350 projects under development and they're at different stages so all the way from initial planning through licensing, some under construction, some under commissioning. So there is still a healthy pipeline of, of projects within the UK. And one of the key drivers for that, as well as having a, an available and known subsidy, is the feedstock. Without having the right type of feedstock, there's no point in actually building one of these things. And if we take the three countries in terms of Scotland, England and Wales, They've all got a different approach to how they've managed that, that feedstock and how they're encouraging it. If we take Wales, they've got a very defined collection system, very much like here in Ireland. Everybody's got the same collection system wherever they are. Therefore, you're getting a standard way of capturing that material. The Welsh government invested directly in its own anaerobic digestion facilities. So it put the infrastructure in place. And we've now see in terms of Wales, I think it's ranked as number three in the world in terms of its recycling and sustainability rates. And that's through the investment that's been put in there to encourage recycling and make sure that things like food waste, as much as possible from both urban and rural areas, is ending up in anaerobic digestion rather than allowing some of it to, to leak away. If we take Scotland, that's had a slightly different approach. You've got a, a variety of different collection schemes, so different coloured bins, different number of bins, depending on which authority you're in. But we've seen that the Scottish government has banned organic waste from landfill. So that's encouraged local authorities and contractors to look at things differently and put in place different infrastructure to actually cope with the treatment of that material. So we're starting to see a greater number of anaerobic digestion plants and other treatment infrastructure in Scotland. If we take England, haven't got a clue. We've got a complete mishmash. 
So there's been absolutely no policy set in terms of, of England and what happens, which has meant we've been operating as contractors, as local authorities, very much within a, a vacuum, apart from having these high recycling targets that sort of get fed down onto the local authorities. Each local authority has its own collection scheme. Some have invested in anaerobic digestion, some haven't. Some have invested in energy from waste infrastructure, others have done something different. So there is really no one system or one type of, of approach to how we treat the organic fraction within, within England. There's been some, some work done and the, the latest DEFRA policy document and the guidance suggests that we should have a separate collection for food waste rolled out across England. So if that's adopted and actually comes into play, then that would actually be a very good start in terms of starting to capture more of this, this available feedstock and bring it into the value chain. We know that the other source is from commercial food waste. So you've got a lot of commercial material out there and it's about putting in place the right collection systems for that as well. So again, there isn't really a standard way within the UK. It's through having these different approaches, uh, which means you've got different capture rates, different efficiencies in different parts of the country. Not very good having this completely free approach to, to how we do things. In Ireland, we've got something slightly different. However, in terms of anaerobic digestion, a study was undertaken and ranked Ireland 80 out, out of 81 <coughs> EU regions. We've got a slight little bit of work to do. We've also seen that in terms of things like emission rates, CO2 emissions, Ireland is very much at the bottom of the pile. It's sort of said a lot of things, hasn't really done a lot yet. The time is sort of right now to really push that, that forward. We're going to see that some of these sectors are going to be significantly impacted upon by what you might think as non-direct policy and regulations coming out of the European Union. The key one that will push this is going to be the circular economy, which is going to set very, very high recycling and recovery rates. It's going to impact across the whole value chain in terms of it's not just going to impact at the end use, so in terms of what we do with it once it's been disposed of, it's going to impact upon how things are manufactured, how they're designed, where those raw materials come from. It's going to have a very, very significant impact on, on what we do. And as I've already said, one of the consistent things we've got here in Ireland, and is actually very good, generally wherever you go, apart from a lack in some of the rural areas, is a three bin collection system. That means if I move house, I'm not having to think, what am I putting in this bin? When does it go? I've got the same collection system wherever I am. But on the other side, a significant difference Nearly every other European country, the municipal market is served by the municipality in that they are responsible for collecting that material from the household. Now, some municipalities do that directly themselves. Others put it out to a private contractor. So if we take, for example, where I um, live in the UK, in, in Wigan, an outskirts of, of Manchester, the local authority sets what materials it's going to collect. And we have a collection system that's been subcontracted out to a waste contract to FCC Environment, and they actually come along and collect the material from the curbside. I go to my neighboring one next door, and it's actually in-house, and they do it directly, the council does it directly. So different ways, but it's, it's, it's managed by the, the council. Here, it's not. The waste service is completely outsourced to the private sector. So you, as an individual householder, decide which waste contract you want to use, and they'll come along and, and pick it up. Some good things on that, every bin is weighed, so we actually know the weights in the UK, they, they don't actually do that. So you're getting some good benefits, and it's a different way of doing it. I don't think, as long as it's regulated in the correct way, as long as there are the right constraints around whatever, whatever the collection is, and as long as it, it's looked at in the right way, I, I think any model actually works. It's about what is going to work the most effective. The other thing we need is a stable subsidy. We've had refit, we don't have a next one coming on. We've had talk around the sort of equivalent of renewable heat incentive. Some of that's there for other projects. We really need to look at that in terms of the large scale for anaerobic digestion. We need that next step in, in subsidy here to help kickstart the, the market. It needs to be a known and stable one because we need that to be able to invest in. So if we're looking at putting significant amounts of, of capital into building these plants and these networks, we need something we know that's going to be there going into the future so we can put the investment in. And I think one of the things that, that we need to do is actually focus on the sources of feedstocks. We've got a number of uh, significant urban areas, lots of chimney pots. Those chimney pots create waste. That waste is either in an organic form in your brown bin, garden and food waste, or it's in your residual bin. There's still organic material in there. That's a readily available source of, of material feedstock for this type of plant that we should be focusing on. 
And then we can start to look at other things. So we've got the municipal markets, we've got commercial food waste. Let's start taking those away from, from less um, recycling or less recycled routes. Let's start making better use of them. Then you can start looking at things like energy crops because you're starting to then encroach on other things like the agricultural sector. Is there going to be a better way of using that land rather than as an energy crop? So it's let's get the, the low hanging fruit. What material can we get hold of more easily and actually put it back into that value chain rather than it leaking out? And then let's look at other sources. So that sort of gives a, an overview really of the, of the marketplace. Thought I'd give you a, an introduction to the Huntstown Bioenergy Plant. Um, it's not actually the, the Guinness factory, although we're, we're sort of perhaps thinking of that. Looks very similar in terms of nice brown liquid. People might want to have a, a taste of it. It's really a combination of mechanical pipes and pumps and a biological digestion process. It's a bit like a giant cow, really. So I'm gonna, my comparison is going to be Ermintrude. This is our cow and how we think of our anaerobic digestion process. We have feedstock preparation, so where it goes in at the mouth. So we're actually preparing. If you think of, of when you take a, a sandwich or a biscuit, you're putting it into your mouth, you're chomping it up to get it into smaller pieces, you're adding saliva to it and sort of making it into a, a more liquid paste. So when it goes into the stomach, which is the digestion part, it's actually able to be broken down by the bacteria there. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're preparing the material so it goes into the stomach. We happen to have tanks uh, and sort of steel stomachs rather than a, a normal natural stomach. And at the back end, we then get the same three things. We're going to get methane. So cow produces quite a significant amount of, of methane. Our bioenergy plant generates biogas. A significant proportion of that is methane itself. So about 45-50% is actually methane. And we want to make use of that. We don't want it going into the atmosphere, causing an impact on the climate. We get a solid, which is in this case a digestate. So the cow, that's the manure, goes onto land as a fertilizer. What's it got in it? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and lots of organic matter. That's exactly the same as, as our digestate when we put it to land. And we get a wastewater. So the cow peas, that goes onto the, onto the ground. It's also got ammonia in it in the form of, of urea, which is a valuable source of, of nitrogen. We want to capture that water and we actually recycle and reuse it back within the process rather than wasting it. So again, we're not drawing on fresh water resources. So this is a, a view of the, the completed Huntstown plant. Um, it's easier to show you in this before we get into the actual photographs. So area one, that giant building, that's the feedstock preparation area. And I'll take you through in detail each of the, the different parts that, that we've got. Area two, you can see the, the Guinness tanks. That's where we undertake the, the digestion um, within those steel tanks. Area three, you've got the, the ball, which is our, our gas dome, and then two CHP engines, which generate an electrical output of, of 4.8 megawatts, and we generate 4.1 for the grid. We've then got the digestate in area four. That's where we separate the solid from the liquid. And then area five is the wastewater plant where we're actually then cleaning up that, that wastewater to be able to recycle it back through the plant. So what does that mean? We have two lines at the bioenergy plant. Our overall capacity is, our license capacity is 90,000 tons a year. We have two separate lines. The first line deals with the MSW organic fines. So as I said, the material that comes out of your black bin at home, rather than it going to, to landfill or incineration, we're able to take that and we're going to get an energy value out of it. So 45,000 tons of that. And the second line is our source separated organics line or SSO. And that's a combination of your brown bin waste, BBW, which is a mixture of garden waste and food waste and also commercial food waste, the CFW, coming from the likes of supermarkets that's outdated on, on the shelf, coming from food production facilities, etc., coming from canteens and other things. And we are regulated by two very important regulators. Um, the EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency, anybody here have dealings with them on a regular basis? Okay, so you'll know they are very um, black and white in terms of what they want. They're, they're typically very fair, but they're very stringent in terms of what they want to do and how they want to regulate things. They're there to protect the environment and make sure we're not putting nasty emissions back into the, either the, the land, the air or the water, and we're not causing noise or, or odor. And the other one we have is DAFM. So the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries, uh, Food and Marine. Anybody deal with DAFM here? So again, and dealing with the vets, who again, don't take a waste view. They're coming at it from a completely different perspective. We've got a set of regulations through DAFM called the Animal Byproducts Regulations. These came out in 2011 in their current form. They're a European regulation. They're there to protect 
the security and biosecurity of the agricultural sector. So things like foot and mouth, mouth disease, um, anything that could be born by an animal and spread sort of across the agricultural sector, um, sort of animal flus, etc. It could be uh, coming from imported meat coming from, from abroad that could have something in it. So there's a very stringent set of regulations about how we treat this material on site and what we can do with it at the end. So this animal byproducts regulations, completely separate from waste regulations and, and sort of doesn't always balance up either. So you, you've got two competing sets of, of regulations there. And the basic premise around that is we have to do things like particle sizes, times and temperatures to, to be able to, to, power, to sterilize that material. So I've said in terms of our, our feedstock, our delivery and preparation, there's a three bin system. We want the brown bin, we want the black bin. Top picture is what organic fines look like. That's fines here from, from in the Dublin area. That was taken um, yesterday, I took that photograph. And the, the line at the bottom, that's our source separated organics. That's a delivery of, of food waste. So you sort of all sorts of different things. And you can see it still has a lot of packaging in there. Paper, cardboard, plastics. This is where we prepare the feedstock before it goes into the digestion process. This is our mouth. So everything has to be weighed in. It's where we start our, our sort of evidence trail to make sure it, we're compliant with the EPA and with the, the DAFRM requirements. We then have to make sure we get all of our material down to a known size. And with the ABPR regulations, for us, that's 50 millimeters. So everything goes through a shredder to make sure it gets down to that particular size requirement. And that's getting it right also for the hydrolysis process, which is a, a key part of what we do. Feedstock is mixed with water, so we're starting to prepare a, a slurry-like material um, to get it right before it goes into our hydrolysis process, which is going to sterilize it. And this is our hydrolysis bit. Very much like a, a giant pressure cooker, we actually introduce steam into the, into the process. We're mixing it together. It's held at a certain pressure, at a certain temperature for an amount of time. That sterilizes it, but it also hydrolyzes the process. So you think like a, a pressure cooker, it breaks down hard to, hard to sort of digest material. So if, for example, um, you eat certain materials, let's say a piece of paper, you decide you're going to eat some paper straight off, you chew that, put it down, it's going to come out pretty much as it is the other end. It's a tightly bound structure. It doesn't break down. If you put that in hot water and leave it to soak for a while, it starts to sort of open up that fibrous structure. If you then eat it, it doesn't really come out the other end. It's able to be broken down in your, your stomach. So this allows us to take advantage where other AD plants can't. They actually reject paper and cardboard. They can't process it. We're able to process paper and cardboard as part of that packaging. And that's pretty unique to what we do here. It's the only plant in Ireland that does it currently. After the hydrolysis, we then screen out the unwanted reject material. So we've still got bits of glass. There'll be bits of plastic that we don't want into the digestion process itself. We put it through a series of screens and a degrip process. So we're taking out the lighter fraction, the heavy fraction, and larger items. So we're very much left with a, a low dry solids percentage liquid that we're going to be able to pump and then put around the digestion process itself. And the AD process itself is a four stage process. We've already done stage one, which is hydrolysis. And it's all very much about breaking down long chain materials, long chain um, proteins into shorter chain ones that can actually be consumed by the, the bacteria and the microbes and generate the biogas. So stage one is hydrolysis. We did that micro um, mechanically in our plant there. We then have acidogenesis, turn it more acid, acetogenesis, breaking it down further. Then the final one, which is we want is methanogenesis. And we do this in our tanks. They happen, all, four, all four, three stages are going on at the same time within the tanks. You're keeping the material mixed together and you've got it all at different stages. And the output of that is a biogas. So at Huntstown, each of our process lines has three tanks. We have what are called two primary tanks where the majority of stage two and stage three goes on. So the acidogenesis and acetogenesis is breaking it down. And then stage three, which is our uh, secondary, which is our secondary tanks, it's stage three of the process. We then got our methanogenesis where we're creating more of that, that methane and being able to draw that off. We actually have methane being generated at all, in all three tanks, but you get the most in the, in the latter stages. We're also stirring those tanks to make sure the material is kept constantly mixed. It helps stop it from stratifying, so you get separating out those heavies and lights. We want it kept in suspension, and it helps to stop a crust from forming on the top. Get a crust on the top, your biogas isn't able to get out, so it actually starts to kill the process. It poisons it. So we want to make sure that that process is kept going all of the time. One of the benefits of using our hydrolysis process at the start is that 
we can shorten our time that the material is within the digesters. That could be 45, 50 days in a normal digester. We're able to run quicker than that at around about 30 days. So it means for the same size footprint, we're able to get more through. And for the same size footprint, we're able to extract more gas per tonne of, of material coming in. It gives us benefits. Biogas is then collected from both lines. It's cleaned and dried before we put it through our CHP engine, so combined heat and power. As I said earlier on, when you generate electricity, you're almost generating the same again in heat. A lot of AD plants waste that heat. We don't. We capture that and we use it back through the process. So we use it to help he keep the digesters heated. We use it to help with the hydrolysis process to create steam. We use it to help in the drying process where we're thermally drying some of our digestate before we send it off out of the plant. And we use it to heat the offices as well. So we're making as much use as we can of that. And as part of that, we're actually eligible for the HECHP tariff. So we're trying to capture as much of that heat as possible. We don't want to waste it. It's a valuable resource. Digestate itself, that liquid fraction, is actually then pumped up to the wastewater treatment works where we can centrifuge it to generate um, a cake and a liquid. The cake itself, so we have two lines, so it's the MSW digestate, so that, that came from the black bins. We're not able to recycle that back to land. Under European regulations, because it's come from a mixed source, we don't know what's actually gone into it. Therefore, we can't recycle it back to land. It must go for, for disposal as a waste. So what we're doing there, rather than send it as a water-laden material back to landfill, we're using some of our heat to actually dry it further, remove that, that moisture content so we get a dry and stabilized material, i.e. it's not going to break down any further when it gets into the landfill, that can then go back to landfill under the lower tariff as a stabilized material. Now, if it hasn't been treated properly, so through a, just a drying process, for example, that material wouldn't be stabilized. When you put it back into a landfill, it would start to break down, generate methane, generate odor, which is not what you want. Putting it through a process like this, where we've digested it, we've consumed those available nutrients, it's become stable, it's not going to break down anymore. So in the landfill, therefore, it's generating very little, if no more gas and no odor. The other output we get is the SSO cake digestate. This also has a value. We're looking at recycling this back to agricultural land. And why would we do this? Three reasons. Nutrients, so the N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So they are valuable sources of organic fertilizer. If you go into the agricultural sector, most fertilizers come from an inorganic source. So nitrogen-based fertilizers come out of, of oil-based processes generally. Phosphorus comes out from rock phosphate, which is a strip mining of, of the mineral from the earth, and then through a ve very energy intensive process to form the fertilizer. Both of those are not environmentally sustainable in the long term. They're also energy intensive um, and create a lot of additional byproducts that we're not after. So this actually helps to create an organic source of fertilizer. The other benefit we have is that we've got this organic matter. By putting that organic matter back into the soil, we're having a, a, another benefit in that it helps to improve the quality of that soil. So in the drier summer months, it actually helps to create a material which isn't as prone to drought because it's got this good structure. The organic matter can hold water. And in the wetter winter months, it actually helps to drain it because you've got this nice structure within there. It starts to run through the soil rather than clogging. If you've sort of seen a clay soil in the summer, you get these big cracks. Um, where it's dried out isn't very good at, at, at sort of holding that water. It just runs straight through. In the winter, it becomes a complete quagmire. So this actually helps in terms of then promoting more sustainable crop growth. There's been a lot of work done in terms of, of using composts and digestates and other derivatives back into agriculture, using it in a more efficient way to actually help promote more sustainable crop growth. And we have to start to change the, the sort of the outlook on the agricultural sector so they're educated in terms of this type of material they understand the clear benefits of it and why they don't need to use just inorganic fertilizers now in terms of the quality of this we have what's called a schedule e in our epa license and that's a whole set of physical chemical properties that we have to achieve to demonstrate this is high quality so we've got to be below certain levels for heavy metals we can't have certain levels of plastic contamination which is a physical one we've got to make sure there are no viable weed seeds etc so we have to go through a whole barrage of tests to demonstrate the quality the equivalent in the uk for compost it's called pass 100 and for digestate it's called pass 110 they're very very similar schemes if you're familiar with those just done in a slightly different way and the final part of that is the the wastewater so we've separated out the 
solid from the liquid the solid has gone back to land or to landfill as a stabilized material we then get this liquid fraction we put it through our wastewater treatment works we're taking out that ammonia if we put too much ammonia back through the process it starts to, to kill it it poisons the process we're cleaning it up and we're able to recycle about 70 percent of this water back to our process so rather than using fresh water we put this into the into the process itself um, to help make the, the liquid requirement the rest is going down to down sewer um, as a cleaned material and then back out to the, the wastewater treatment works for further treatment for example at, at rings end so you can see we're very much looking at at taking the sustainable approach not just on our feedstocks but also in terms of what we do with our output so the, the the water and the heat that we get from this as well so why should we be doing it in sort of simple terms we're helping to reduce waste so what each of us generates at home and at work that goes into those bins that traditionally has ended up in, in landfill we're re helping to reduce that we're helping to reduce the impact of climate change so by being able to put a green electricity into the network reducing emissions that way buying it by being able to put a, um, a renewable source of gas into the network we're helping reduce emissions that way and by reducing or by putting out a, a more a, a less polluting form of vehicle fuel we're helping to reduce emissions into the atmosphere that way and have health effects so we're helping to to protect the climate change reduce emissions into the atmosphere and reduce sort of the impact of climate change and we're helping to protect and enhance the environment so we're putting a waste into a controlled process that's, that's tightly managed it doesn't allow leakage into the atmosphere or into the surrounding environment and we're generating a valuable resource out of that and whatever goes back into the environment is helping to to protect and enhance it things like the organic matter and the organic fertilizers and it's helping to generate cost-effective renewable energy thank you very much thank you Steve. Um, we'll try and take a few questions now just uh, for people who are uh, remotely if you, uh, dialed in um, on the web stream. If you could use the hashtag on Twitter, we're having difficulties getting onto the Gmail. So um, anyone who's got any questions remotely, if you could put them on Twitter and uh, just start in the room maybe to see a few queries. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for that. And just a question on the demarcations, which like ever decreasing gas prices at the moment, is there kind of a level at which the gas price is not economic to go down the anaerobic digestion route? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I think there's a number of, of variables. Obviously the, the cost of building and operating the plant, you've got your base capital and OPEX cost, so you know where your, your base is. That helps set your, your revenues that you need. The level of gate fee that you get for your incoming feedstock, that's important. The higher that is, then the lower you can afford to go at the back in terms of your your subsidy you're getting for whatever the energy is you're, you're generating. So it's about balancing those up. Um, I think one of the things we, again, we don't always take into account is that where we're importing, say, natural gas, it's not just about it's being extracted from a country somewhere. There's all of the cost and the environmental impact of transporting it here and then you know sort of offloading it and putting it into, into the grid. Yes, that does sort of move up and down. I think... There isn't the full cost benefit analysis on that type of material. It's heavily subsidized already in terms of how it's how it's produced and where it comes from. So if you had no subsidy, no, we can't compete with that. We do need a subsidy, be it on the electricity or on the gas as a renewable heat incentive or as a renewable fuel. But once we know what that is as a steady, stable subsidy, we can then look at how do we achieve that. So as I said, within the UK, We've seen those pots get smaller and smaller each year and you know, sort of getting down towards less and less subsidy as people have become more efficient. I think we need to get to that point. I can't give you a single break-even point. It depends on the process and those other variables. But if we know what our subsidy is going to be, we can work our models around that and then look at what is the most efficient from a cost perspective that we can develop and operate our plants. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Stephen. Um, just two small questions. One, what's the contamination in the brown bin in Huntstown? And the second, do you see agricultural industry, aka farmers, seeing the value in digestation? So in terms of the contamination, uh, brown bin and, and garden waste, we used to have a thing in, in, in the UK where I was working in the, the same industry. 
you know, it's a garden waste bin. That means you could get a lawnmower in there. You could get garden benches. Anything that you'd have in the garden, people would try and put in their, their garden waste bin. So we get all different types of contamination. So there will be paper. There's cardboard. We get bits of metal in there. Um, it, everything that somebody could have at home could go in that, that bin. The key to reducing that is two things. One is stringent quality control at the curbside. So we know, for example, some of the um, collection companies are now employing CCTV on their um, refuse collection vehicles. So when the material is emptied into the bin or into the back of the truck, they know whose bin it is. It's taking a picture of it. They can sort of see what the contamination is through visual recognition. It's very sophisticated software. And that means you can directly charge the householder for contaminating the bin. So that's one way of doing it. That's a sort of a direct impact. The other way is through education and actually working with the householders, working to say, look, we need to be putting clean material in here, get it right because of these other impacts. And we need to do more with education. So the contamination could be all sorts. We need to work on education and reducing the amount of contamination. We see we see various things coming through. Uh, I even had a dead horse coming through once. So this, this is the sort of type of thing you, you can get. In terms of the agricultural community, it's a again about changing long-term culture. The agricultural community doesn't change readily and there are good reasons for that. They need to be shown the benefits. So over a period of time, again, if you take um, the UK, I did a lot of work with places like Rothamsted, which has spent, uh, and Silso, which has spent many, many decades in terms of looking at the impacts of things like sewage sludge and the benefits and things like compost and sort of getting those back out to the agricultural community. And the only way to do that is to get their buy-in. We've got to work very much with the agricultural community, demonstrate the benefits to them, and sort of get them to gradually to slowly change. So it's not a quick process. I think they will eventually see the benefits of it. Some of that will be pushed perhaps by regulation um, to sort of say we need to look at alternatives or putting higher taxes on things. But importantly, it's working with the community to show the benefits of it. So I think they will. It's a long-term process, and we need to bring them on that story. Um, yep. Uh, where are you guys at at the moment uh, in relation to that? To what you're saying, four and five thousand on either screen, where you currently see them? Um, we we've got the it's going up. We've got the quantity there. Um, we're working through uh, our final stages of commissioning at the moment. So we're shortly going to be going up to sort of the the you know those four levels. The quantity is there. It's all contracted. Um, so we know it's there. There's actually excessive amounts in terms of especially things like the. MSW organic fines from, from the Dublin area. So we've got no problem at all with the inputs. We're now just taking it up to those levels of, of processing. In terms of where it's located, the, the process is easily expandable. In terms of where we are at Huntstown, we can't expand. We don't have the, the land on that site. We would have to, to buy new land and build a new plant. So the process itself is easily expandable. Just where we are, we can't really get any more in. My question is, uh, I mean, it's a very impressive looking plant and the whole idea of producing biofuels seems to make sense to a, a relative layman. I'm not an expert in this area. But what I wanted to find out, Stephen, from you is, we'd say if the whole country was going to go on to uh, the same system that you're running in Huntstown, how many of your of these plants would be needed across the country, assuming it was economically viable? And where does the incinerator down on the south port, how does that fit into the overall equation? Okay. In terms of the electricity needs or gas needs, we don't have enough waste within Ireland to cover all of that. It's very much a, a mixture of, of electricity sources. So onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, various ones. So we're part of that energy mix. Anaerobic digestion isn't a solution that's going to fix everything. We don't, we don't have enough waste to make enough plants to generate electricity to cover everything. So that's the, the, the first bit. In terms of the, the gas, I think if you take the study that Gas Networks Island did with the investment they were looking at and the number of plants, which was a significant amount, Again, that's only going to provide a small amount of the quantity of gas that's used. So we're not going to generate everything. So we're a part of that, that mixture of, of different types. And it needs to, be, needs to be balanced off. And if we look at vehicle fuels, yes, you could use us. There's also things like you know, electricity being used for cars that can be done and things like hydrogen for certain things as well. So we're part of a, of a fuel mix. So we can't provide everything.
Um, and in terms of, of energy from waste, that still plays an important part. If we take the black bin waste that we receive, that's gone through a process before it gets to us at a mechanical sorting plant where they've separated out that smaller fraction that we want, that sort of sub 50 millimeter fraction from larger materials, which include a lot of plastics. So uh, includes a lot of, of textiles. It includes a lot of paper and cardboard that's gone into that stream. The, probably the most efficient thing you can do with that is send it to an energy from waste plant in some form, capture the energy value. And by that, I mean electricity and heat. Energy from waste plants create a lot of stable heat. There's the opportunity to generate district heating schemes as well. So it's not just about electricity. If you take, say, the Swedish model or the Norwegian model, they do a lot of district heating as well as electricity. So it becomes part of the mixture. What happens is it becomes a smaller part of the mixture. I don't think we can get away from having energy from waste plants if we want to safely and efficiently treat all of our waste. We're not going to get to a point in the near future where we have zero waste. We're not going to get to a point where we can have everything sorted out completely cleanly to use as commodities going other places. We've seen, for example, in China that they've put down twice now um, quality control barriers, so Operation Green Sword being the, the latest, where they've cracked down on, on contamination coming in. So it actually means that it's got to be cleaner from generating at places like our, ourselves. So we need, we don't want it going to landfill. So therefore, probably the, the most efficient use of that material is to put it through a modern energy from waste plant, generate electricity and generate heat for a district heating scheme. It's part of it. Liam O'Clary here from the uh, Environment and Climate Change Committee. Uh, uh, it's a question you may not want to answer. <laughs> but do you pay for, for the waste? Most of the, t most of the waste we get, we are paid for it. Okay. So household municipal waste, it would have gone to land for energy from waste, and there is a charge for sending it there. We're able to, to sort of, we charge a slightly lower amount than it going to those, which helps encourage it to come to us. A lot of the commercial food waste, we are paid to take. There are some materials that are very high energy yielding, things like glycols that we may pay to take in because it's like adding rocket fuel. It's actually adding a very sugar rich material into our feedstock and we get a much higher gas yield. So there are one or two material streams that we would pay to take. Others, we are paid to take. So the second follow-up question to that is, for the waste that you pay for, are you required to apply any sustainability criteria to that waste? In looking at the, in a limited form, yes, because of we would look at where would it have gone, how are we now using that? So we'll sort of look at is that the most efficient way? I know that if we take the the UK sector again. If you're taking an agricultural crop, you have to do a whole set of sustainability variables. I was at Ricardo at the time when we were one of the companies that developed one of the sustainability models that are used out in the, in the sector. So from an agricultural perspective, yes, you've got to look at your sustainability. From an industrial plant, no, you don't in the same way because you're taking in a waste. But we would still look at what is the overall impact of taking in a, a stream. That, even though we're paying for it, it's still somebody else's waste. They've discarded it. Therefore, it's fallen into the waste stream, not a non-waste, if that makes if that makes sense. So we don't have to do it, but we will look at what the impacts are. So, uh, given that you've come from Ricardo, you'll be familiar with uh, um, software like yep. carbon calculator. Yep. The calculator the, the carbon intensity of, of waste and yep. how fuel is from waste. But is there any regulatory control over your operations in that sense, it, it, like there is from, say, the the, uh, the red, the, the red. Not in the, the same way. Obviously, when we apply for our license to operate, we have to go through a process of looking at best available technology. So we're sort of regulated at the start of the process in terms of what is our technology going to be. And we're regulated in terms of what are the feedstocks we're going to put into that process. So the EPA could say, no, you're not having certain feedstocks because we don't think that's the best place for them to go. So we're, we're sort of regulated at that front end before we start to operate, which sort of puts us into a into a narrow stream. But we don't have the same regulation in terms of, of carbon emissions tools, et cetera, that we have to follow, as you say you would in the agricultural sector. No, we don't have those. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, one on, on the Gmail from somebody watching uh, remotely, Alan Brady. He says, um, 
Based on the 13,000 cubic metres of concrete and well over 1,000 tonnes of steel used in the construction of the plant, has there been an estimate of the carbon footprint created in the plant's construction? We haven't created one, as then that would have been done at the tendering stage when we looked at the technology and the companies that we would use. And it's not just about having what's the lowest cost construction company or the lowest cost technology. We looked at a number of um, parameters, including things like the sustainability they would achieve through through the build. We were encouraging the use of recycled materials, etc. So that was done through the through the tender process. We're doing it the same for our um, second plant that we're looking at in Belfast as part of that tender process. We are looking at, at those type of metrics. So yes, I don't have the figure um, to, to hand, but it was done as part of the evaluation process at the start. Hi, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if you'd like to comment on um, perhaps the length of time or the programming of, of, of this type of um, infrastructure from maybe concept to commissioning, how yep. long does it take? And um, oftentimes um, I find that for these type of assets, it's the regulatory processes and procedures that yep. take an exceptional amount of time, if you'd like to comment on that. The, it is. The planning and licensing process are the longest parts of it. So typically on, on this type of plant, you could be in planning for anything up to a year before you can do anything. Um, your licensing could take between six and nine months. Construction and commissioning is about a two-year process for a plant of this, this scale. Much smaller ones, you could be up and running in between nine and, and 12 months. We're obviously a much larger, more complex facility. But it is the planning and the licensing that are the, the, the sort of the, the key ones to get over. Um, and it's having that, yes, we've got a very democratic form of, of planning, which is the correct thing to, to do. But it, again, it's sort of putting things in the right locations and being able to provide the right reassurances that we're not going to be causing any form of environmental harm, be that noise, be that odor or any other emissions. And as a, as a responsible operator, we should be able to demonstrate that as part of that planning process. But I do sometimes think that that the planning process can get very bogged down and can take an overly long time to actually re reach a, a decision. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. One, they can be understaffed. The other one, they can look at it and go, it's a bit of a complex project. We want to kick that further down the, the line. We'll let somebody else handle it. Um, and the other one, because it's dealing with waste, people don't want waste facilities near them. And it can be a bit of a political hot potato for when it's coming around to local elections and things. So planning is the, the sort of the big the big unknown, um, even if you do it correctly, it can take a long time. And it is those regulatory things that take the time. Just to follow up, um, maybe from concept stage, yep. I don't know if you had the site, how long did it take to decide whether we're going to progress a, a plant at Bunch Town? So we, we acquired the project um, when it had already been concepted and consented through through planning. We made some changes to it. So typically that can take, say, let's say a year to get your concept and, and general idea around. Then if you're going to say your your planning and permitting could be another year on, on top, so that's two years, let's say a build of a year. So you could be three years from concept through to delivery and into operation. A bigger plant, you might be, say, four or five years in total. Experience from other types of, of waste facility as well, taking energy from waste plant could take seven to ten years to, to get through. So it, it's, it's part of the nature of the system. But yeah, anywhere between so perhaps three years for a, a pretty simple one to slightly longer. Uh, you mentioned that the Hunt Town plant is going to uh, be yep. there. No, um, where where we are, most of our, our high grade heat, we get two forms, high grade and low grade heat. The high grade heat is used back within the, the process. Our low grade heat we use for things like the offices. We're too remote from surrounding areas for a district heating scheme, and we don't generate enough heat to make it viable to actually put in place a district heating scheme. If you take the EFW plant down in the docks, for example, that's actually in a great location because you, you're very near to commercial and residential um, properties. They're not far away. You could actually put in place a district heating scheme. So it depends on your location. We're too remote. We're sort of, you know, we sit out sort of um, on, on the edge there. Um, we don't have enough residential density nearby to make it worthwhile to, to do that. It's not viable. It, it just wouldn't stack up. Um, very, very little. We we use virtually all of our heat. 
Stephen, just yep. to report, um, Cavanta gave us a tour around two years ago. There's 30 megawatts of hot water yep. going into the Liffey at the minute. We tried to talk to Dublin Council about district heating, but it's a question that nobody wants to pay, pay for it. Yep. Effort to go through this five to six year yep. project balance stage. And we've, in, um, in the UK, there was a carbon fund um, used to help promote, I think 20 million pounds was was put aside to help develop district heating schemes. We've gone through the same thing where you've got some very good EFW plants, got great potential, but nobody wanted to pay to put the infrastructure in place. We're now starting to see that. So there's one in Leeds that's gone in, there's one down in Plymouth that's going in. So we're starting to see some of these district heating schemes, but they take a long time. It's been a very slow and painful process getting them in. Yeah. There was one I was working on and it was the one the heat pump. Yeah. And it was taking heat from London Underground and putting it into a district heating system in Islington. Yeah. And there was a company in Cookstown who was doing the engineering for that. Very, very clever, but it was it was such a fluke that it actually it happened. Just as as a comparative I made, there's um in Holland, um I think it's round Rotterdam. They've effectively got the 5G of heat networks. So we're, you know, in the UK or Ireland, we're sort of 1G at the moment. They've got, they take industrial users and generators of heat and um, dedicated generators of, of heat as well. And it all is starting to go into a, a heat network. And they're doing the same with gas to actually bring people off, um, off, uh, off of gas networks. And they're putting it into their own heat networks to sort of heat things. So there are very sophisticated ways of doing it, and you can link dedicated and industrial generators and users of, of that heat if you do it correctly. I think that's one of the, the real good examples. No, that's great. That's I think that's a really good use. We need to make use of, of these, you know, the full energy output of these facilities. Great. Listen, that's, uh, it's been a very active Q&A yeah. session. <laughs> you must be tired of that. No, no, very, very happy to answer questions. Um, so uh, thank you very much no for, for the presentation. It was great. Um, and uh, I particularly like the innovation around the the time with the electrolysis and reducing the time that, uh, that you have to leave the plant um, or leave the, the material in. Um, so look, I, I'd like if everyone could just express our, our gratitude to Stephen for, for <laughs> And maybe just to uh, to let people know, the next event we have is on, I think it's March 4th, first Wednesday of the month we have our events on. Um, the next one is going to be on RES. So we have two speakers on the night, uh, James Conlon, who's the um, project manager in the department rolling out RES, and David Connolly, the CEO of IWEA. So it should be a, a good, uh, interesting event, given the, the timing and, and, and uh, how we're finally, hopefully, going to see RES happening this year. So um, hope to see you all there, and please spread the word. We'll have the details up on the Engineers Ireland website. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. You.